Red Ball is a physics-based platformer that was released in 2009. Based on the box 2D physics engine, the game is known for having extremely satisfying, intuitive gameplay that allows the player to command an immense amount of control. Over the past 12 years, through large-scale community efforts of glitch hunting, strat finding, and dedicated running, the 12 main levels of the game have been conquered by human hands in less than 3 minutes. With such a dedicated following, it would make sense that Red Ball would have a TAS, or tool-assisted speedrun as well where a sequence of inputs are programmed ahead of time and read by the game with the goal of creating the best theoretical completion of a video game. With how optimized Red Ball is as a speed game, with top times being just seconds apart, one would probably expect this tool-assisted speedrun to be just a moderate improvement. With the game as basic as Red Ball, you would probably expect the tassing scene behind it to be pretty simple. However, thanks to the immense dedication of a select group of individuals, Red Ball's nature as a physics sandbox has been thoroughly exploited in order to produce a task of just 2 minutes and 28 seconds, 25 seconds faster than the real-time world record performed by Carmel. In this video, we will go level by level through the current Red Ball task, thoroughly analyzing every single glitch, strategy, and technique that is used, which will include a detailed technical explanation of why the infamous spike glitch works, a glitch that can seemingly grant Red Ball invincibility to spikes just by briefly pausing the game. This is the Red Ball tool-assisted speedrun world record fully explained. Firstly, it is important to provide some background on the Flash game tassing scene as a whole and the challenges that we have faced in order to actually produce a TAS of Red Ball. The vast majority of games are tasked using some kind of emulator that supports it. Tassers use emulator functions such as save states, slowdown, and frame advance in order to craft the desired inputs, which can be saved, shared, and played back at any time. Unfortunately, it is currently impossible to test the majority of Flash games using this method. The best platform for speedrunning Flash games, the official standalone Adobe Flash player, does not support any tasking functions, unsurprisingly. The three Flash game emulators currently in existence, those being GNash, LightSpark, and Ruffle, have extremely poor compatibility with the immense Flash game library. Both GNash and Ruffle only support most ActionScript 1 and 2 games, essentially only reaching Flash games from versions 1 through 8, which does not include Red Ball. And though LightSpark does technically support ActionScript 3, it doesn't really produce the greatest results. Not to mention that none of these emulators have any tasking capabilities. Thankfully, LibTAS, a Linux-based piece of software intended to provide TAS tools to games, has been able to link with GNash to allow TASs of games like Webzy's Amazing Adventure to be created. Unfortunately, for Red Ball, this leaves no deterministic external measures for producing a TAS. So, in February of 2021, the game itself was modified in order to program in necessary tasking capabilities like save states, frame advance, input writing, and input loading. The task hack went through dozens of iterations, with new features constantly being added like a timer, velocity information, contact body information, hitboxes, contact points, and most recently, an accurate visualizer for how Spike Glitch is actually working in real time. On a detailed view of the hack, you will find an input display here, the current level time here, Red Ball's X, Y, and rotational velocity values here, his corresponding positional values here, and his object contact information here. It is also worth mentioning that Red Ball runs at a very unusual 31 frames per second. So, if the decimals for any level time seem weird, that is why. Now, with all of that out of the way, let us delve into the tasks of level 1. The task of level 1 features Red Ball jumping twice, completing the extremely straightforward level in 3.065 seconds. Simple, right? Wrong. First of all, it is worth noting that, while RTA speedruns start timing from the first input, the tool-assisted speedrun starts timing right upon loading level 1. 
Red Ball spawns slightly above the ground, and since Red Ball accelerates faster on the ground, it is actually possible to complete level 1 two frames faster starting from there. However, the task must start by holding right on the first frame. In the air, Red Ball gains 0.25 horizontal or X velocity every frame. When he hits the ground, he starts gaining 0.5x velocity every frame, but the physics engine starts converting some of this x velocity into rotational velocity at a 1 to 2 ratio, eventually equalizing them. Once Red Ball's x velocity is greater than or equal to 5, the game is supposed to prevent him from generating any more through this block of code. Red Ball is at 5.17x velocity on this frame, so no more velocity is generated, and 0.17x velocity gets converted into 0.33 rotational velocity, equaling them out at 5.00. However, due to a double rounding error, Red Ball's exact x velocity is actually 4.999999999999, which the game interprets as being less than 5. So, Red Bull is then able to generate 0.5 more X velocity on the next frame, raising it up to 5.50, or 5.499999 to be more precise. On the next grounded frame, the game would convert 0.17 X velocity into 0.33 rotational velocity, equalizing the two at 5.33. However, the task jumps on this frame, preventing the conversion from happening. This whole technique is known as a 5.5 jump. Red Ball travels in the air at 5.5x velocity, but just before hitting the ground, the TAS actually presses left for a frame, causing Red Ball's x velocity to drop down to 5.0, or 4.9999, okay, this joke is getting old, just below the speed cap. This allows Red Ball to reach 5.5x velocity just before the next jump. This technique is known as a left-right jump, had this left press not been performed, the game would have performed the 1 to 2 rotational velocity conversion, equalizing the two velocities at 5.33. This single left press is the difference between a 3.097 and a 3.065, saving a single frame. Upon collecting the flag, Red Ball must wait 2.8 seconds before progressing to the next level. The timer would normally expire after 87 frames, equating to 2.806 seconds at 31 FPS, but inconsistent frame times can push this to 88 frames or more, which loses time. The game also spends some time actually loading the next level, time which isn't counted by the task timer since it is based off how many frames the game has processed. However, to try to keep the game running at an average of 31 FPS, Flash greatly reduces the frame times of the starting frames in the next level, causing the time save and the time loss to effectively equal out. <laughs> The level 2 task starts with a similar 5.5 jump to level 1. The jump key is released at a certain frame, and just before hitting the ground, a 2 frame left input is performed in the air to set up another 5.5 left right jump. Red Ball lands perfectly between the ground and this triangle, allowing for the first instance of a compound jump in the run where Red Ball is able to gain a large amount of height by executing two vertical velocity generating events in short succession. In this case, Red Ball is able to first jump on the ground and then on the triangle on the very next frame. This allows Red Ball to gain a massive amount of height, positioning him above the pendulum. Upon hitting the pendulum, much of its momentum is transferred into Red Ball, on top of a sizable chunk of Red Ball's Y velocity being converted into X and rotational velocity, putting Red Ball far above the intended 5.0 speed cap. Red Ball then lands on the back corner of this platform, allowing even more Y velocity to be converted, a technique known as a corner boost. The bounce off the pendulum is actually slightly non-optimal to allow for this to happen. Red Ball lands on the final platform and collects the flag with an X and rotational velocity of 8.89. The task starts by moving Red Ball to the right, but unlike the first two levels, the typical 5.5 jump is not performed, since the jump point does not line up well with the rest of the level. Thus, a left-right jump is performed instead. 
left is pressed by itself for one frame, dropping Red Ball's X velocity from 5.33 down to 4.83. On the next frame, both the jump and right keys are pressed, and 0.33 rotational velocity is converted into X velocity at a 2 to 1 ratio, raising it to 5.0 and the right press generates 0.5x velocity, raising it to 5.5. Red Ball then lands in a pit of deadly spikes and lives. This is how it happened. As Red Ball moves around any given level, both the level and Red Ball must move in the opposite direction each frame to keep everything centered in the game's camera, similar to a person running on a treadmill. So, the normal update order for the game is to move Red Ball, check for spike collision, move everything in the opposite direction to compensate, and then render the next frame. However, if the screen scrolling acted in a completely one-to-one -one fashion, the game would look extremely stiff, and Red Ball's movement wouldn't feel very natural. So, Red Ball uses something called a tweener to control the scrolling of the screen. Following an equation curve that looks something like this, the screen smoothly scrolls over a maximum period of one second to keep Red Ball near the center. This is why Red Ball's position in the camera isn't completely fixed, and why the camera often continues to scroll for around a second after Red Ball comes to a complete stop. To check if Red Ball is contacting any spikes, the game uses 16 equally spaced test points around Red Ball's circumference. During the game update phase, after Red Ball's position is updated, a point to pixel check is performed between these 16 points and the spikes in the level, comparing to the last rendered frame. If any of the test points are overlapping a spike pixel, Red Ball will die. The tweener then activates, and the next frame is rendered, showing Red Ball in 8 exploded pieces. However, something really interesting happens when the pause menu is opened. Game updates stop happening, shown by Red Ball ceasing all movement, but the screen scrolling tweener is actually still active. You can see that when I pause the game, the screen spends a second catching up to Red Ball despite no other game updates happening. And after the second, the tweener deactivates. After unpausing the game with the menu open for over a second, both the game and tweener enter the update loop again as normal. However, what happens if you unpause the game before a second has elapsed? Since the tweener is still active, it is only the game updates that need to be reinitialized. And because of Flash's ordering, it gets placed after the still active tweener in the update loop. With this, screen scrolling effectively gets delayed by a single frame, something which is completely imperceptible to people playing the game. However, this tiny change makes an enormous difference when it comes to Red Ball's spike collision detection. In this frame from the TAS in level 3, Red Ball is shown as being above the spike pit. With the tweener being placed before the game updates due to a sub 1 second pause, the whole screen scrolls to the left, acting on the movement that happened on the previous frame. Red Ball's movement is then updated, placing him down and to the right, now barely above the spikes. The spike collision check fails since no test points are overlapping spikes, and then the current frame is rendered. Now, on the next frame, the out of place tweener scrolls everything to the left, and then Red Ball's position is updated, placing him inside of the spikes. It appears that Red Ball should die during the spike check since one of his test points is overlapping a spike. However, this isn't so. Now, recall that the last rendered frame still looks like this. The internal position of Red Ball is here, and the internal position of the spike pit is here. Though the spike pit may look like one object, each individual spike is actually its own object with its own rectangular bounding box. When a pixel check is performed in Flash Player, an important optimization takes place that dramatically speeds up game performance. Flash first checks to see if a test point is in the bounding box of the desired object, before checking to see if the point is actually overlapping with a pixel of the object. Since bounding box checks are orders of magnitude faster than the pixel checks, this optimization makes complete sense since the pixels of an object should always be enclosed inside of its bounding box. However, thanks to a misplaced tweener, the actual spikes and their corresponding bounding boxes are not in the same location as the spikes shown on the previous rendered frame. For each spike, the entire object, shown by its previous rendered frame position, is not inside of its current bounding box. 
When Flash performs the spike collision check on Red Ball's test points, it passes the bounding box check, but the point to pixel check fails since it is performed against the previous rendered frame. The only area where Red Ball can fail the spike collision check with Spike Glitch active is where a current spike's bounding box overlaps itself from the previous rendered frame, an area that becomes smaller as Red Ball's speed picks up, completely disappearing at very high speeds. Due to a tiny mistake made while programming the game, and due to a tiny optimization oversight that exists in Adobe Flash Player, Spike Glitch exists. However, this doesn't explain why it is inconsistent with identical inputs yielding different results, and why its consistency dramatically falls when playing the game at lower resolutions. Each frame, the tweener moves in accordance with the deltas that come from the system time, rather than in accordance with the frame time, which is 32.258 milliseconds at 31 FPS. If Red Ball ran perfectly at 31 FPS all the time, this wouldn't be an issue. However, this is not the case. Flash simply tries to average 31 FPS, which means that frames can end up being either shorter or longer than 32.258 milliseconds, as the frame rate rises and dips respectively. If a frame takes 30 milliseconds, meaning the frame rate is instantaneously above 31, the tweener will only scroll by this corresponding Y position on the one second long tweener function, incurring less screen scroll than expected, making the spike hitboxes larger than expected. If a frame takes 35 milliseconds, meaning that the frame rate is instantaneously below 31, the tweener will scroll by this Y position on the graph, incurring more screen scroll than expected, making the spike hitboxes smaller than expected. This is an absolute nightmare for tassers, since a program set of inputs are unable to yield the same result every single time. It isn't deterministic. No kind of RNG manipulation will ever fix this issue because there is no RNG causing it to happen. It is simply impossible to force Flash to run at a perfect 31 FPS at all times. Therefore, in the TASAC of the game, the tweener was modified to use 31 FPS frame timing instead of the system time, which makes the amount that the screen scrolls completely deterministic and makes the game overall significantly less tricky. Now, let's touch on why higher resolutions make spike glitch more consistent. As mentioned before, the spike collision check is performed using a point to pixel check, where one of the 16 test points on Red Ball must be overlapping a pixel of a rendered spike for the test to pass. At lower resolutions, like the game's default 550 by 400 resolution, the spikes are very jagged, as the impacts of anti-aliasing are immense, significantly increasing the space that the spike takes up in relation to its bounding box. At higher resolutions, such as 1920 by 1080 which is known as the sweet spot between spike glitch consistency and game performance, the spikes are significantly more pointy. An anti-aliasing has far less of an impact on the size of the spike in relation to its bounding box. Counting the pixels, the pixels of a 550 by 400 spike take up around 63% of the bounding box, while 1920 by 1080 spikes are just slightly more than 50%, which is closer to what is geometrically expected. Therefore, there is a much greater chance that one of Red Ball's test points will overlap a spike at the game's default resolution. Interestingly, if you make the game window small enough, to the point where it is basically impossible to play, spikes will never be able to kill Red Ball since the pixels just never render. However, this technique is not allowed for obvious reasons. Spike glitch has now been fully explained, and effective spike hitboxes will be displayed in orange in the technical task hack view for the remainder of the video. Now, let's continue with the second half of level 3. Red Ball performs a 5.5 jump on the ground below the spikes and lands on the right side of this elevator platform. Though one would expect this platform to be very sturdy, it is actually only hinged on a single point in the middle. So, if an object is able to land on the platform with the right amount of speed at just the right position, the platform will actually tilt, snapping back into place on the next few frames. On the last frame of kickback, the task presses the jump and right keys, allowing for a compound jump to be performed. Red Ball attains an insane negative 12 Y velocity, note that down is actually the positive Y direction with Flash games, and despite the influence of gravity, Red Ball is able to ascend all the way to the top platform with the flag. However, instead of collecting the flag while airborne, the task skims the ground behind the flag to allow for a few frames of grounded acceleration to the left, saving two frames.
Redball has to wait a bit at the start of the level because of the crusher cycles. A grounded left-right jump is performed, and Redball lands just past the corner of this bottom stair. Through careful maneuvering, Redball grazes the corner of the fourth stair, allowing for another jump to be performed without losing any X velocity. Redball then gets a corner boost off of this falling platform, and jumps into this axe, completing the level. The reason why this works is because of a strategy called the Death Warp, which is caused by Redball's position in the entire level being set relative to the camera upon death. In this case, Redball is at about X position 815 and Y position 240. Relative to the 550 by 400 camera, this Death Warp position is off screen, just barely overlapping the ending flag, allowing for it to be activated. For a far more in-depth explanation of this strategy, make sure to check out my Death Warp Explain video if you haven't already. In the TAS hack, the Death Warp is shown by these two boxes, with the current position being the lagging box and the eventual position after the screen scrolls being the leading box. The Death Warp doesn't happen until the frame after Red Ball dies, so as you can see, there is just a sliver of the lagging box overlapping the flag, allowing for it to just barely be activated in this task. In fact, if it weren't for Red Ball's hitbox fluctuating outwards and inwards while moving, this speedy death warp would not be able to be performed as quickly. The hitbox fluctuation is caused by a square-in-square -square phenomenon. A square of fixed size always encloses Red Ball's sprite, rotating as the ball rotates. However, since all bounding boxes in Adobe Flash Player need to be parallel with the coordinate plane, another square with zero rotation must enclose this first square, constantly expanding and contracting as the inner square rotates with Red Ball. It is also worth noting that the task actually waits a frame longer than necessary at the start, since going as soon as possible would cause the flag to be missed and it is the optimal alternative to slowing down before the flag since it would cause the camera to catch up to Red Ball more, reducing the death warp distance. In level 5, the task performs a grounded left-right jump, activates the wall trigger, and, using a combination of up and left tapping, positions Red Ball perfectly between the ground and the slope. Another left-right jump is then performed, with a compound jump on the ground and slope, allowing Red Ball to travel in the air with 5.5x velocity, and just enough height to reach the flag. The first 3.871 was found through manual methods, but even with a brute forcing script, nothing faster has been able to be found, meaning that it is likely impossible for this level to be completed any faster. <laughs> Through a combination of quick left and right inputs, Red Ball lands on the beginning ramp in such a way that a massive amount of vertical and horizontal speed is able to build up, actually freezing Red Ball's position for a few frames. A result of Red Ball landing on the thin intersection between two different collision polygons, something which is specifically avoided in the level 5 task to prevent losing any unnecessary time. At this specific point on the slope, the Taz is able to perform a compound jump between two of its edges, allowing Red Ball to gain a massive amount of height while traveling with an enormous X velocity of 9.2, the highest that has been generated in the Taz thus far. With this setup, Red Ball is able to graze the corner of this grassy platform, allowing for another jump to be executed without losing any X velocity. Red Ball makes it all the way to the large turbine, getting a corner boost off the top spoke, raising Red Ball's X velocity all the way to 12.81. Then, Red Ball gets yet another corner boost off the next spoke, raising it to 13.16. Before Red Ball lands, left is pressed for one frame, and a final corner boost raises the X velocity to 14.66, almost three times the speed cap set for normal grounded acceleration. <laughs> Red Ball jumps onto this bounce platform, and at the very peak of its bounce, a compound jump is able to be performed. Red Ball exits the platform with a massive negative 15.6 vertical velocity, and by holding the jump button on the way up, Red Ball is able to reach the top section of the level. 
Redball performs a corner graze jump, jumps in the spike pit thanks to spike glitch, jumps on the top of the box stack, and then surprisingly falls back down to the bottom. For top level RTA speedrunners, this occurrence is an instant reset, as it typically loses 3 to 4 seconds over staying on the top route the whole time. However, the TAS is able to use the falling boxes to do something pretty magical. Red Bull lands on the right side of this box, reaching an X velocity of 5.55. He then corner boosts off this second stair step, and then off of this third stair step, reaching an X velocity of 10.11. A compound jump is then performed on two of the edges of this ramp, just barely allowing Red Ball to reach the second bounce platform, where another compound jump is then performed. Red Ball gets yet another corner boost off this ground segment and ends the level with an X velocity of 12.44. <laughs> Red Ball is maneuvered to hit the steep parts of the beginning ramp as much as possible without pressing the left key too much. A short jump is performed on this frame, and the jump button is released and pressed again to manipulate Red Ball's subpixels to allow for a jump to be performed on the ending tip of the ramp while barely losing any X velocity. Once again, the jump button is released and pressed again to manipulate Red Ball's subpixels. Red Ball barely avoids contacting this barrier and barely makes it under the first pencil without contacting it thanks to the manip. Red Ball enters the car and it appears in the contact list quite a few times due to Red Ball colliding with the many razor thin polygons that make up its body. When the car catches the downward slope, Red Ball jumps out of the car and lands on the top of the windshield. Red Ball lands on the hood, and the front wheel of the car begins to clip inside of its body, another consequence of the car's makeup. The wheels clip further and further inside the car until eventually, it gets ready to snap back. Red Ball slightly clips inside of the car himself, causing him to contact all 10 of these internal polygons at the same time, shown by the contact listener. Red Ball comes in contact with the displaced right wheel of the car. The next frame, everything instantly snaps back into position. Without even jumping, Red Ball goes flying with an immense X velocity of 24.28, the highest that is attained in the entirety of the TAS. Red Ball actually has to slow down to 24.03 X velocity to make sure that he doesn't fly over the flag at the end. Red Ball quickly reaches the flag, the car nowhere in sight. Leaving the level playing, it takes around 3 seconds for it to catch back up. At the start of level 9, the TAS stalls Red Ball a bit so that more X velocity can be built up on the ground of the first slope, making it possible to jump all the way to this corner and receive a corner boost. Red Ball rolls straight through the spikes thanks to spike glitch, jumps on this specific part of the slope, and then gets a corner boost at the end of the ground platform. Red Ball lands on the moving green platform and activates one of the green buttons, causing the platform to disappear. The TAS also executes a jump input on this frame, which is able to go through since Red Ball's groundedness check occurs before the button activates and the platform disappears. Red Ball gets a compound jump between the ground and the slope, causing him to ascend above the intended route for the level. Extra speed is also gained here from Red Ball boosting off of some of the internal polygons on the platform. A short jump is executed as soon as possible, and the left button is tapped to set up a corner boost off the end of the plunger as it moves around. Red Ball jumps off of the first pendulum just past its peak, generating some X velocity, and lands on the backside of the third pendulum to receive another small boost, reaching the flag platform with an X velocity of 17.15. <laughs> Bye. Bye. 
The test holds red at the start, but the button is actually released for a single frame at this point. This is done to manipulate Red Ball's subpixel position and allow for a faster corner boost off the first barrier. Red Ball survives in the spikes due to spike glitch, gets a corner graze jump off the second barrier, and gets a back corner boost off the fourth barrier, leaving Red Ball with 7.61x velocity. A compound jump is performed on the first bounce pad, giving Red Ball enough height to skip the other two bounce pads. A compound jump is performed between the ground and slope, Red Ball generates velocity off of the box, and then he quickly jumps between the first and second boxes, effectively producing a compound jump. This doesn't generate as much height as normal, but it is enough to position Red Ball on the backside of this stone, where a large amount of Y velocity is converted into X velocity. With just one jump in the spike pit, Red Ball is able to barely avoid being grounded on the spoke, and collects the flag with 13.33 X velocity. <laughs> By pushing against the front side of the train, the space between the carts compresses, allowing Red Ball to exit from being under the spiky ceiling earlier than normal. Barely squeezing through the gap with spike glitch, Red Ball lands on the ridge between the 10th and 9th carts on the train. After jumping, you may have noticed that the game still has the 9th cart in the game's contact list. So, what exactly causes this to happen? Rewinding a few frames, we can see that Red Ball first makes contact with the 10th cart. The next frame, Red Ball is contacting both the 10th and 9th carts, so they are both in the contact list. However, on the next frame, the 10th cart somehow enters the contact list again, which would indicate that Red Ball is touching two of the internal polygons. However, looking at the debug view, it just looks like one rectangle. But zooming way in on Red Ball, you can see that there is an extremely thin polygon on the right side of the cart. Its existence likely caused by a weird attachment to the solid connector piece. On the next frame, Red Ball leaves cart 10, meaning that the two entries should get scrubbed from the contact list. However, due to a programming oversight, the game simply removes the first two objects in the contact list, which happens to be the larger rectangle of cart 10 and the body polygon of cart 9. On the next frame, before Red Ball jumps, the game notices that he is touching an object, cart 9, which is not in the contact list, so it adds it in there. Red Ball's jump is then executed, and on the next frame, the game sees that Red Ball is no longer contacting cart 9, so it removes the first entry from the contact list, which is the razor-thin polygon on cart 10. So, that is why Red Ball enters the air with the game thinking he is still contacting the 9th cart, something known as a contact bug. This is extremely useful, since for jumping in this game to be allowed, two conditions have to be met. There has to be something in the contact list, and at least one of Red Ball's three contact points below him must be activated, determined by whether they are within any solid Box 2D body. When Red Ball approaches the large red spikes, there is a frame where, hovering just above the object, the middle contact point turns green. Because of the contact bug, the two conditions for Red Ball jumping are satisfied, so he jumps just above the spikes without ever actually contacting them. This happens another time, with the distance between the hitboxes being so close that it's impossible to zoom in enough to see the gap. Red Ball successfully clears the red spikes, placing him far ahead of his intended position in the train. Red Ball quarter boosts off the first black platform, causing it to enter the contact list, and as Red Ball exits the platform, the first entry is removed, cart 9, leaving the platform in the contact list. This phenomenon happens with all future objects that Red Ball touches. Once the contact bug is activated, it can't be removed without restarting the level. The flag at the front of the train is collected around 12 seconds faster than what the game intends to be possible. Red Ball jumps up the barrier at the start and then jumps upon reaching 5.5x velocity. Red Ball lands in the first spike pit, using a left-right tap to maintain 5.5x velocity, but a jump is not executed right away. 
This is to allow Red Ball to enter the covered section without bonking on the ceiling, which would otherwise lose several frames. A left-right jump is used to keep 5.5x velocity in the covered section, another left-right tap is used before hitting the ground, and another left-right jump is used to exit the covered section. A corner boost is performed off the box, the small spike pit is jumped in, and Red Ball actually bonks on the corner of this platform before the saw blade, something which unfortunately can't be avoided given the speed that Red Ball is moving. Red Ball performs a compound jump between the ground and the bottom stair step and rides the top of the ski lift ramp to reach the end of the main game in just 2 minutes and 28 seconds. However, this is not the end of the task. There are 5 once site locked bonus levels after the main game, and due to a King.com advertisement that once existed in the game, prompting users to travel to the site to play the bonus levels, the transition between level 12 and level 13 is 10 seconds as opposed to the normal 2.8. So, let's move on to the bonus levels. Red Ball rolls into the jaws of a knockoff Pac-Man, exiting on the first frame possible. Red Ball jumps once roughly 5.5x velocity is reached, and resets at the checkpoint flag upon contact. This resets all of the objects in the level to their default position, a technique which is used far more often in RTA speedruns. Red Ball jumps through the metal platforms, bonking on the bottom of them to reduce Red Ball's Y velocity and allow for jumps to be executed as soon as possible. Then, Red Ball jumps against this wall and is able to get launched above it. This is possible because Red Ball gets stuck in the wall for a few frames due to interactions with thin polygons. While Red Ball is stuck, he is able to jump multiple times in the same spot. Red Ball gets a corner boost off the green wall that is supposed to be removed with the switch to allow for further progression in the level, and then jumps off of the ground. Red Ball lands on the back edge of the moving platform, and in the middle of the deflection, Red Ball is able to jump with a very low Y velocity, placing him between the tiny gap created by the spinning star and the end platform. <laughs> Red Ball jumps over the spike pit and then into the top left corner of the moving platform for a corner graze jump. Red Ball executes a jump on the right side of the one-ton ball to convert much of this vertical velocity into horizontal velocity. A jump is performed just before this catapult, and Red Ball is able to execute a compound jump between the ground and the top left corner of the catapult's bolt. Red Ball completely skips the level's puzzle, jumps on the ground, gets a corner boost off the falling black platform, and executes a jump at the front of the next patch of ground, allowing Red Ball to ascend just above the ninja and collect the flag. <laughs> Right is pressed and unpressed multiple times near the top of the slope to allow Red Ball to get the greatest amount of speed possible from it. There is no concrete method to this madness, it was simply brute forced with a program made by Roblox8192 that tried thousands of combinations of right presses to find the one that generated the greatest amount of speed. Red Ball jumps and gets a corner boost off the back of the ground. He then lands on the slope of the ending platform as soon as possible, which allows for the greatest amount of speed to be generated from it. Red Bull accelerates to the right and jumps into the bottom left corner of this platform in a way that lowers his rotational velocity. This allows for a cleaner entry into the underground section of the platform, since Red Ball's rotation isn't pulling him to the right upon landing. However, if this technique is overdone, the entrance is extremely clean, but time is ultimately lost due to Red Ball spending too much time hitting the wall. The optimal implementation of this strategy saves just two frames since the downwards Y velocity lost by contacting the wall has a great impact due to how long the fall is. And a frame of this time save comes from Red Ball's hitbox size being manipulated to allow the flag to be collected a frame earlier than normal. <laughs> Red Ball jumps into the tip of the first star since this allows him to get a boost off the slope behind it without having to press left. 
Red Ball jumps once roughly 5.5x velocity is reached, and a corner boost takes Red Ball into the bounce platform. A compound jump is performed, but the horizontal distance traveled is cut short. Red Ball lands on the slope behind the tip of this rotating star, allowing for a considerable amount of Y velocity to be converted into X velocity. Red Ball gets a corner boost off the next tip, and performs a graze jump off the left tip of this star. Red Ball crosses the large gap between the two crowns, avoids the moving platform, gets a corner boost off the tip of this star, gets a corner boost off the next tip, gets a graze jump off the elevator platform, and reaches the flag platform, closing off the 17 levels time at just 3 minutes and 39 seconds. Over 50 seconds faster than the current world record of 430.663 by Carmel. So, there you have it. The Red Bull Tool Assisted Speedrun World Record Fully Explained. In this video, we covered how 5.5 jumps, compound jumps, left-right jumps, corner boosts, spike glitch, death warp, hitboxes, contact bugs, and more all function. Red Ball is a game made for a platform that was largely abandoned at the start of 2021, but that hasn't stopped the community from completely taking it apart, maximizing the potential of the game in both real-time and tool-assisted speedruns. As Flash emulators improve and more TAS hacks are created, I sincerely hope that our efforts will inspire the creation of TASs for other Flash games like Run 2, Fancy Pants, Toxic 2, and Bananas. A huge thank you goes out to all of these people for helping me immensely with this project, and I would like to thank you all for watching to the end.